the breaking headline out of Dallas at this hour. A police chief there calls this a very unique case. It's involving an off-duty officer who shot and killed her neighbor in his own apartment. Amber Geiger was an off-duty police officer arriving home after a long day of work sometime around 10 p.m. Her neighbor, 26-year-old Botham Jean, was in his apartment. Exactly what happened next is still a mystery, but what we know is Geiger went to Jean's apartment. She says she thought it was hers. When she saw him, she fatally shot him. I thought it was my apartment. I thought it was my apartment. She says that over and over again in this five-minute uh, recording. Is that significant to you? It's significant to the, the point that it makes me feel that that call was staged. Uh, it made me feel that she had already spoken with someone. Geiger, still in uniform, said she thought she spotted a burglar. But in fact, it was the apartment's resident, Botham John. She then fired two shots, hitting John once in the chest. The thing that stands out the very most to me was the fact that when I listened to that call, not one time did I hear Emma Geiger say that she was in fear of her life. We're still dealing in America with black people being killed in some of the most arbitrary ways. Driving while black, walking while black, and now we have to add living while black. I'll never see him again, and I want to see him. I still want to see him. She always would tell me she wish she could t take in his place. Two families changed forever. And assessed the defendant's punishment at 10 years imprisonment. And Amber Geiger's sentence sparking anger. 10 years for a man's life. No, there's no justice to this. How many of us is it going to take before you understand that our lives matter? And an incredible act of healing. But what's next for the city of Dallas? If we can't get justice, there won't be a damn Texas OU game. There won't be a state fair. Anything going on. Marcus Moore joins us from Dallas. Marcus, good morning to you. You spoke with two of those jurors who convicted Amber Geiger of murdering her neighbor. Yeah, Cecilia, these two jurors gave us a glimpse of what it was like inside that jury room as they made this difficult decision. And they told me there were sleepless nights and a lot of tears. I think that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. This morning, two of the jurors who found former Dallas police officer Amber Geiger guilty of murdering both of John are speaking out. There's no way we can ever know what he would want, but I think we all had to make a decision that we could live with and that our conscience could be sound with. The diverse jury made up of eight women and four men, all of varying ethnicities, sentenced Amber Geiger to 10 years behind bars. These jurors telling us the decision was not an easy one. There was a lot of crying. A lot of crying. When we were told to go decide between five and life, that was like, we didn't have words. Prosecutors were asking for 28 years. They were. Um, you all landed at 10. After hearing about how his family talked about him, he seemed like just the light in their lives, and he was kind and just forgiving. caring and forgiving. And I, I said, I told everyone, I was like, I'm really having a hard time with this because we all agree that it was a mistake, and I don't think, I, th I don't think Bo would want to take harsh vengeance. I think he would want to forgive her. And I felt, I didn't feel like I had any right to speak for him. And he isn't there to talk for himself. But listening to how people talked about him, I felt like he would forgive her. They asked for 28 years, and I'm going to be honest and, and true. I was like, I can't give her 28 years. Yeah. I know a lot of people are not happy about the 10 years, but I felt like, you know, for this case was not like any other case. You can't compare this case to any of those other officers killing unarmed black men. Those officers that killed unarmed black men, when they got out, they went back to living their lives. Amber Geiger, ever since she killed that man, she has not been the same. She showed remorse and that she's going to have to deal with that for the rest of her life. Radio, d d d DJ, One Nation, One Station. All right, all right, all right, guys. You are listening to the Judge Show Round Show. I am Valerie Denise Jones, 929-477-1167 is the number to call. Again, please continue 
using your chat lines uh, to keep the conversation going. But at this time, what I'd like to do is open up the line 215-876, 215-876. Welcome, welcome, Attorney Lee Merritt. How are you doing today, sir? Thank you. Um, so I really can't give your resume justice, so would you just share with our listening audience a little bit about you and also how do you choose your cases? Okay, I'm, I'm from Los Angeles, California originally. I attended undergrad at Morehouse College Law School at Temple. I'm a civil rights attorney. Uh, I practice exclusively in the area of civil rights. Uh, which is constitutional violations. While I'm based out of Philadelphia, I practice all over the country, um, and I represent the the Botham's Jaw family. In the most recent case, I'm the lead lead attorney working with uh, attorneys Daryl Washington and Ben Crump uh, to 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 get that family some modicum of justice. And um, um, the way this case cho- uh the way I got involved in this case is how I get involved in most cases. Something tragic happens, and a family gives me a call. Uh, the Jean family, who are from St. Lucia, uh, called the um, their ambassador and asked for guidance on legal help. And uh, the ambassador called Senator Royce West, and Senator Royce West gave my office a call, and I've been working with them ever since. Wow, that's beautiful. Now, the lady in the audio clip um, suggested that this case is not like any other case. Uh, do you care to expound on that? Because I, I really think yeah, I, point. I, I disagree with that sentiment strongly. I've heard it a lot. This somehow this is an exceptional case, and it's not. This is a case of an unarmed black male get, being assigned an unreasonable threat or some sort of fear just by virtue of his his existence and likely his blackness, and him having using deadly force used on, on him in an unjustifiable way. When you put it like that, it sounds like what we hear every day. It uh, sounds like the 1,100 uh, officer-involved shootings that happen or um, police officer-involved deaths that happen a year. Um, it's unique because of the alibi used. Uh, now, generally, her uh, uh, Amber Geiger's alibi was I feared for my life. But in this case, the reason she feared for her life is because she said she walked into the wrong apartment believing it to be her own. I haven't heard that before, so that is a unique defense. But when you boil it down to the legal ramifications, it's a, it's a fear for my life defense. And she felt justified for using deadly force. The problem was her fear was unreasonable. It wasn't based on anything tangible other than someone's existence. Oh. Now, I did want to ask you about the castle doctrine that was introduced. But is Amber, uh, is she dangerous to society? Is she you know, something that we, we should fear because uh, I was kind of confused. Well, not even confused. It was just I, I noticed, like, it, it just seemed like a kind of a hustle, you know, changing the color of her hair, uh, presenting herself in such a way that, you know, we'd have pity on her. And, you know, just a lot of things. I don't want to put things in, your, in your, your head, but should we deem her as dangerous to society? Because it's possible she'll be getting out soon, right? Yeah, than we I, wanted to, I, anyway. I do see her as a, as to me, she represents an ongoing threat to society in this regard. Uh, she lied on the stand, and her lie was demonstrative. Um, and although she has apologized to the family, she maintains that lie. Uh, so there's a duplicity going on. The method that you described of her changing her look and uh, sort of appealing to our society's innate protection of whiteness. Uh, she lighted up her hair. She began to wear blue dresses, and um, you, know, you know she looked like a damsel in distress. Uh, but when it was all said and done, she committed a murder. Uh, she never, you know, she never pled to it or confessed to it. Uh, she offered an apology, but she did so while lacing her apology with lies. The, the most glaring lie that I think makes her a danger is that she said that you know Bolton was coming at her when she shot him to death. Uh, he was in his own apartment. He had every right to come at her. But the the physical evidence doesn't support that claim. Both of them were shot, according to the medical examiner. The bullet traveled down through his body, went through his heart, entered his, uh, his, his uh, stomach, 
uh, than both the small and large intestines. The bullet had a downward trajectory, uh, which is um, indicative of him actually being in a seated position on his couch, maybe possibly beginning to stand up when he was shot down. So if that's the fact pattern, if that's what really happened, then she hasn't offered a rational explanation of why she would do that other than evil, you know, that she doesn't value life, and, and she's willing to lie about it. And so until, for me, until she's willing to come clean about what actually happened there, and we still don't know, and the family still doesn't have that closure, then I think she's, she represents an ongoing threat to society. Oh. And, and um, I do want to just very briefly, because uh, I'm going to bring in the judge here in a second. I'm looking for him now. But um, as it relates to forgiveness, because uh, when I think of forgiveness and I think of our people, I always go back to the very beginning and also a movie that's now on Netflix where they talk about introducing religion. Then people, you know, immediately they put their guards down. Um, the fact that that was introduced do you feel like if roles were reversed and this was a white family, a white brother, a white father, that they would be as forgiving? Do you think that that would be the case? You know what? The um, I'm I'm proud of Brent, the uh, 18 year old brother of both of them, Jean, uh, for having the maturity and bravery to go in front of the world, uh, but particularly go in front of the person who killed his brother and say, "I forgive you." I don't know that I, I possess that possess that spiritual maturity. Uh, we know that forgiveness is for the forgiver and not for the forgiven. Uh, that Brant could be um, hampered with unforgiveness his entire life. It could affect him physically. It can affect the way he sees the world. And he chose to let that go so that he could move on um, in a way that many of us just aren't capable of not only doing but understanding. And I struggle with it, and his sister struggles with it, and his mother struggles with it. Uh, but he believed that that was both a reflection of his faith and a reflection of what his brother wanted him to do. Uh, I had a, I just had a long breakfast with the Jean family, and we were discussing the difference between St. Lucia and the United States. St. Lucia, which is predominantly black, they don't experience racism the way we experience it in this country. And they, and they don't see the world through race-based lens. When he forgave Amber Geiger, he wasn't forgiving the white race, the white police officers for all the crimes that they've done against humanity. He was forgiving her for taking his best friend from him. Um, and he didn't see it as an exonerate. He didn't think he was speaking for the black race because in St. Lucia, a predominantly black island, he doesn't have to. His, his Every action that he takes it doesn't say something about the black, black people. It says something about the Jaw family, who's a unique family a uniquely graceful family and loving family and Christian family. Uh, and he speaks for himself, and he's a representative of his, of his family. Um, but if we, it, it, it happened, it happened, this crime happened to happen in America. Uh, and so we, we like to speak in general, generalities. Would white people do this for black victims uh, or vice versa? Would, would white victims do this for black uh, uh, felons? And the answer is probably no, but it also doesn't matter in this case because this is that, that's just not the fact pattern here. Now I played that audio clip earlier. How did you um, feel hearing the judge, the jury, um, state that they, from the get go, uh, assumed it was a mistake? They referenced him using his first name like Bo, and it, in, a, in a sense, it kind of dehumanized. Uh, him, in, in my opinion, but I mean, they just they just felt like, you know, they were kind of doing us a favor, giving her ten years because they really just felt like she was, you know, displaying some remorse and uh, she should be forgiven and all should be well. So mm-hmm. that sentencing was for us to appease us. Um, how did you feel listening to that audio clip? I, I, I had mixed emotions. I, I don't think that they dehumanized them. I think that they did the opposite, that they, the prosecution was successful in humanizing them so much so that the jury reached a conclusion uh, based on the character of Botham Shemjong. And they said, we made our decisions based on what Botham, what we believe Botham would want. And they were probably right about his character. That's not what, what was supposed to happen, though. They were supposed to make a decision based on the law. The truth is, in our judicial system, we spend too much time focusing on the character of the victim and not on the the bad acts of the culprit, of the person on the defense stand. 
And so they spent very little time talking about how blameworthy um, Amber Geiger was. Uh, they spent a lot of time, and you know, the critical point in this case, in my opinion, was the trajectory of the bullet that established that she was lying. They didn't discuss that at all. Uh, it seemed like not a major point, but when someone takes the stand and lies to you to your face, uh, that's a big problem. They they focused on what she admitted to, which was she did intend to kill both of them, uh, which was blameworthy, but in their mind it was based on a mistake, and not only in their mind, in the mind of prosecution, who more or less accepted the mistake effect um, principle that she she did mistakenly end up at that apartment, as unreasonable as that was, given all the clues that she was that she would have had at her disposal that she was, in fact, not at her apartment. Uh, so, I. I was I don't know so much that I was bothered by what these two jurors said, uh, but it, it it always surprises me what juries have to say. I, I will tell you this: this is the most diverse jury I have ever seen anywhere in the country, and it's because the citizens of Dallas County responded so adamantly to the call for jury duty. Uh, if I could get a jury like this in every one of my cases, uh, then I expect a successful result in every case. The reason that we received a conviction for murder, which most people did not expect when they're honest with themselves, despite the, the um, how bad this crime was. It's because we had that diverse jury. Uh, and so I, I have to take the good with the bad. I don't like this sentence, but I do like the conviction, which is the first conviction of a white female police officer for killing a black child in the history of the United States. Um, it's progress. It's slow progress. Uh, but I accept the providence of the jury as their own. And I just want to make a very clear point um, to black America. Because a lot of people, you know, we don't know how to feel at this point. So I just want to get your take on um, this one clip. Um, and then we're going to bring in the judge. I think I see him now. All right, folks, social media has been on fire talking about, of course, yesterday's uh, decision by jury to give 10 years to Amber Geiger. But that's not really what folks have been focused on is that is a couple of things that took place where the judge in that case came off the stand, embraced Amber Geiger, and handed her her Bible. Stories to say today say that that judge led Amber Geiger to Christ. Others have been talking about the brother of both of John coming off the stand and also embracing uh, her as well. So that's it. Uh, what do you want people to, to hear? And <laughs> Is there anything that you could say to us, to the listeners, to the people who are just, we don't know how to feel? Um, you were in the courtroom. You witnessed all of this, the, the forgiving, the crying, the <laughs> judge coming down, the lady brushing her hair, uh, you know, the, the brother asking, you know, for a hug. Is there, what do you want to say to us? And I have to take each in order because they all happened at different times and there were different things going on. Amber Geiger was just convicted for murder before she was sentenced, and a black bailiff came over and comforted her, one of her fellow law enforcement partners. Um, it was inappropriate. It was offensive to the family. It was offensive to me. Uh, it's representative, I agree, of a lot of the, the backlash that we're hearing about all of the actions is representative of this very docile, overly forgiving culture uh, among African Americans, particularly where uh, in, in law enforcement where they put blue before everything else until they get in trouble and they learn very quickly that they're black like the rest of us. Uh, found that very problematic. Uh, Brant, the 18-year-old who has been struggling with the loss of his brother for the past year, uh, uh, who's deeply rooted in his faith, as his entire family is, uh, who has been under tremendous pressure and torture in, in the, the glare of the, uh, the, not only that, but the bright lights, not having a chance to mourn because he was too busy fighting for justice for his brother. All of that going on in the mind of a, a kid who started off 16 and ended this process at 18, uh, he came to the conclusion that what his brother would want and what his God would want was for him, him to offer her forgiveness, and it gets into this sort of complicated discussion or deeper discussion about the difference between justice and mercy, uh, Brant agrees that the killer of his brother should go to jail, and she should, she should go to jail for a lot longer time than what she's been sentenced to. And despite what he said on the stand, he agrees to that. What he said on the stand, though, was that that would be justice, but my conscience dictates that I display to you mercy, and mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Right, 
you get something much less than you deserve. You get grace. You get love when you, you when you have earned hate and death. Um, I did not expect an 18 year old who had been through all that to express that level of love and grace. It blew me away. I've never seen anything like it in court. I probably haven't ever seen an example like that in life where somebody was just adamantly trying to work out what it really meant for him to be a Christian. I admire him for it. I think it was amazing. I feel very differently about that than I felt about the Bayless. Then the judge got in on the show. <laughs> and um, you know what? There was a human <laughs> moment in that court. Um, it, it was it, jurisprudence had been melted away. There was not a dry eye in the room. No one knew what was going on. Brant didn't tell anybody he planned on doing this. In fact, he wasn't even given an impact statement until two minutes before he gave the impact statement. He tapped the prosecutor on the shoulder and said, you know what, I do have something to say. And so the prosecutor is crying, the parents are crying, uh, families are crying. Everyone is saying, what is going on? You can hear his sister active, actively welling in the background as her, as his brother, as her brother forgives the the, the woman who murdered her, 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 her both of them. Um, and the judge had a human moment. She was like, well, I guess I'm Christian too. Let me grab my Bible. Tell this kid how proud I am of him. Tell him I've never seen anything like this in her many years on, uh, in, the, in, the, in the law practice. Go over to the, the defendant and violate all kinds of procedures. You don't touch someone who's been convicted of a crime. You literally, the rules are you don't touch them. I, I, had a, I had a friend who was convicted of a crime when I was a kid. And I gave a, a witness or a, a character. I was a character witness for him. And I tried to give him a pound on my way out the court, and my feet never touched the ground. The bailiff dragged me out the room. The rule is, once they're convicted, you don't touch them. It was wrong for her to allow uh, my client to give this woman a hug, and it was wrong for her for, him, for her to do it herself. But I don't actually fault her for it. She had a human moment. We all did. I started to look at the other side and say, maybe I don't hate these people so much. Maybe I shouldn't be driven by hate. Maybe I should be driven by love, love for my people and love for justice. But maybe um, maybe we all got it wrong and Brent got it right. Um, but, you know, she had a human moment is how I see it. I don't, I don't actually fault her for it. Uh, yeah, there was a lot I didn't understand, um, including her wardrobe. I saw she had on flip-flops, and I was just like, what in the world? <laughs> It's going on in this courtroom. <laughs> yeah, we'll send you the picture. Yeah, she's got on flip flops and uh, yeah, it was, it was something else. All right, so I appreciate that. Uh, before you go, please make sure that you break down what um, Amber's future holds as it relates to the, the ten years and, and a possible appeal. I want to get that from you before you leave. But here's the judge: three two three six four six three two three six four six. Welcome, welcome, sir. <laughs> Hello, Miss Valerie. Hello, guest. Hello, How are you? Hello. How's everything, Counselor? Okay, now hey, Judge, how are you? Okay. My professional opinion after being involved in this business for five decades is the judge, first off, should be severely reprimanded at the minimum for her conduct, also her attire. Second thing, the bailiff should be reprimanded. Third thing, we recently forget our positions in history. Now, just imagine, if you would, what our recent history would look like if Emmett Till's mother had made a big to-do about forgiving the persons who lynched her son. We've got too much Christianity, and Christianity was imposed on us so that we would do what this Negro did when he got up and forgave this offender for what happened to his brother. We are supposed to forgive him. Boss, we sure love you. We, we forgive you for whoop and put that whoop on us like you've been doing. We understand what you got to do to keep all your livestock going like they supposed to go. See, that's what we've been doing for entirely too long. There's a historical perspective. Uh, a lady friend of mine said he's not a bad-looking young man. That's the brother. And she said, she thought maybe he was angling for a future TV career, say some appearances on CNN, um, 
the morning show, the view and such like, and uh, maybe he's angling. But you see that shame. Now, it's not unusual for somebody to forgive someone who has killed a relative. I mean, but the circumstances are usually somewhat different. I can recall a bench trial. It was a murder case. It was a black senior chief petty officer in the U.S. Navy who killed a white gunnery sergeant. I found the man not guilty. Following that, I was about to tell one of my bailiffs to intervene when the white father of the white victim walked over to the black defendant, but he stuck his hand out, so I told him to hold up. And I heard him tell him, he said, you know, no hard feelings. You did what you had to do. I told that fool years ago somebody was going to kill him if he did not learn to control his temper. He said, you know, but you see, that's a different kind of situation. We have to start taking things into context. Now, as far as the verdict goes and the sentence I believe I predicted quite a few months ago on some radio appearances that in most states what happened would be meritorious of a verdict of guilty for what a lot of states would call criminally negligent homicide. For Tennessee, for example, had the woman been found guilty of criminally negligent homicide, the sentence would be between 3 and 15 years. As a first offender, the sentence would have been presumptive at three years, absent some aggravating circumstances, and in consideration of the background of the defendant, to wit being a policewoman, it would have merited probation. Now, this, by the way, is not the first time a female police officer has been found guilty of killing somebody black. One got found guilty in my courtroom, but, of course, it didn't get covered by the press, and that's been three decades ago. It's not unusual, but we think in terms of what's usual by what the press conveys to us. And right now we have to understand that the press has an agenda that they are pushing as hard as they can. So I won't belabor that. If you've heard me before, you'll know what I think that is and what its purpose is about. But we have to understand that the press has switched in the last 40 years from being an institution that at least gives lip service to the function of being informative so that under the mandate that they have through the First Amendment, they can assist the citizenry in acquiring information about the goings and comings of their governance and their circumstances so they can be informed, advised, and intelligent citizens when it comes to developing a consensus and actualizing that consensus through the ballot. That's not what we have. We have a media that has been engaging in what amounts to almost Nazi party type propaganda. And it seems that the objective is the emasculation of the country. Now, I would say this. He was killed eating a bowl of ice cream, supposedly. The issues that resulted in the the charge of Castle Doctrine, which is not out of line in terms of the total package, and giving the charge was something that actually was wise because it removed one issue from the appellate process. During the appeal, the state can't get a greater sentence, but they might wind up finding that the defense Uh, might have some appellate issues that would result in the overturn of the verdict. I am a little disgusted at the press in certain areas, and it was disgusting. Yes? Judge, one second. Um, Miss Attorney Merritt has to leave. I want to just make sure the two of you have final words, Uh, because he's got to get back here. He had 30 minutes. Okay. My 
disgruntlement with what happened is the press in certain quarters is expressing outrage that the woman was convicted. I think she didn't keep a proper lookout. Somebody let her in. She should have been on cue that somebody had a key. Was it a booty call that went wrong? We don't know because she never got around to being questioned vigorously on that. And the state had no evidence because the victim was dead and he was the best witness to that. But it was certainly criminal negligence negligence for opening fire when you had not properly identified the target. The Castle Doctrine would have relaxed that to an extent. So the theory, I imagine, was if you walk in and you think it's your own home place and you are relying upon the law, which is the Castle Doctrine, then you don't have to make all of the identifications that you otherwise might have to make before you exercise the use of deadly force and engage in what you think is a self-defense matter. In the Castle Doctrine, if somebody breaks into your home, you can go for it, but there's usually a requirement for what amounts to a tumultuous entry. If only because there are practical considerations, like you don't want a homeowner to suffer grief for the rest of their lives because they shot a son or daughter coming home early from school, or a drunken next-door neighbor, or even a spouse who couldn't sleep and went out for a walk and somebody in a fog guns them down. You don't want that to happen. But criminal negligence is is good, and then under Texas law, they have a generic category of murder that resolves into sentencing uh, considerations rather into degrees and categories of homicide. So 10 years is on the stiff side for what amounts to criminally negligent homicide. Right. So Thank you. Um, it is what it oh. is, but... You know, it's a historic moment, and we need to seize upon it to use it for purposes of enlightenment and moving the paradigm to another level. All right. Thank okay. you. Um, Attorney Merritt, um, is there anything you'd like to say to what the judge just um, what he said? And also, can you give us your contact, any, contact information, any final words? Sure, and um, I'm sorry that I have to go because I think that the judge and I uh, have some points of disagreement and some points of agreement that, 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 that deserve discussion. Um, one of my one of my co-counsels, Daryl Washington, I may be available to pick up where I left off, but I, I will I will say a couple a couple of things. I do fully agree with the judge about how the Castle Doctrine uh, played a role here. I was very reticent when the judge allowed the Castle Doctrine instruction to go back to that jury because I, I, I don't believe that there was enough evidence in the record to establish a Castle Doctrine defense, but it, it, it helped curtail an appealable issue because that, you know whether or not there was, there was sufficient evidence of that, if there was any evidence that the jury could consider to apply the Castle Doctrine and the instruction did not go back to them, then you create an appealable issue. I do believe that this judge um, um, was trying to avoid uh, creating a appellate issue in this case, and she made some close calls in favor of uh, the, the prosecution that probably changed the outcome of the case. Namely, she she prevented the defense experts who were the lead investigators to the Texas Rangers in this case, whose testimony carried a lot of weight. She prevented them from saying, we don't believe that she committed a crime, which they wanted to offer that as evidence or in expert testimony, their conclusions that there was no probable cause for an arrest in this case um, and that it was all simply a, a big mistake and that she did exactly as she was trained to do. Those conclusions would probably have been devastating towards gaining a conviction, and she kept them out of this case. Uh, with regard to Brent, the 18-year-old sentiment, um, Judge Joe Brown uh, um, compared – that response to this scenario to that of the mother of Emmett Till um, and I get the comparison it's important that we um, as a people take a stance that is often not popular so that we can progress as a people what we had here was a very different situation uh, what we had here instead was a white woman who had been convicted of murder um, who had been essentially brought to justice 
Whether or not the measure of justice was adequate is up for debate. I don't believe that it was. I don't believe 10 years was sufficient. But this was after a sentence had been levied, after the the most damning charge that she could be uh, convicted of murder, she was convicted of, and you had justice or uh, something that resembled justice. And that justice gave this child an opportunity for mercy. And that's a personal choice. But Brant believes in justice. The Baltimore Jean family believes in justice. I believe in justice. We are fighting for justice in a multitude of cases across the country. Um, and when you have justice, then individuals have the opportunity for mercy. Most families that I represent are denied that opportunity. And the mother of Emmett Till was denied the opportunity of justice. Her, her, her child's killers went free. Um, and so I don't know that the two situations can be compared. Uh, if you watch both of Charles' mother and the dignity that she uh, carried, comported herself with and the demands and the pressures that she has kept on the city of Dallas uh, from the beginning of this case until even after the verdict, I think you see some similarities between her and them too. Um, with that said, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come on. Um, like I said, if you all want to continue this conversation with my co-counsel, Daryl Washington, an esteemed uh, uh, attorney who I believe uh, Judge may yes, be familiar be with, nice. um, he, will, he will be calling and following me. The yeah, just, just text me the number. <laughs> the court okay. concurs. Yeah, just text me the number and we'll oh, continue with the him. Court concurs. Uh, Valerie. Yes, Valerie. sir. Yes, sir. The court concurs in that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So you want to thank you. Thank you for taking your thank you for taking your time and coming here. I know you're busy. Get back well, to, I, I, uh, and watch your stress level. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Watch well, your shout out your contact information, sir. Sure, sure. You can reach me at Lee Merritt ESQ on Facebook and on Instagram, Lee Merritt ESQ. You can reach me on my website at Lee Merritt ESQ dot com and on Twitter at Merritt Law M E R I T L A W. Uh, my office number is eight 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 six four seven three zero four one. Judge Judge Brown, I I really appreciate. Um, Number one, your wisdom that you apply to every situation. Uh, I've always told people if we don't understand our history, if we don't know our history, we're damned to repeat it. And I and I appreciate that you never go with whatever the popular um, uh, mainstream sentiment is. If you if you if you take on an opinion, and you're sharing it with your listeners. It's because you have both the wisdom and experience to actually know what's behind what's being said. And I learn something every time I hear from you. So I appreciate you having me on for a moment here. And I look well, forward to speaking Consular, with you. Again. I appreciate the logic and rationality you brought to the discussion. Sometimes on this venue, we don't have that. My context is, is when I started practicing law in Memphis, they had just desegregated the courts less than a year and a half before I started practicing. There was still a lot of uh, residuals from uh, this it hadn't even been five years since Dr. King had been uh, murdered. Uh, we have a whole lot of situations going on in terms of my perspective as an old man in my seventh decade, being in a situation where, well, God, the way they accounted, I'd have to say eight almost. But the way things go, see. I take it in the context of the struggle was there to be waged when I got involved in this. And from my perspective, the struggle is not over. So I take things in context of that big picture. I never wanted to be a lawyer. I found myself becoming one by necessity, and I couldn't be a scientist. Thanks to Ronald Reagan ruining the curriculum opportunities at the University of California, but that's another story. So I appreciate your perspective. It was well reasoned and well taken. You know, this is just, shall we say, the pleasure of the court. So glad to have had you here and bring your associate on. We'll entertain it. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Yeah, I think they're contacting them now, Judge. I look forward to talking to you in the future. You'll be blessed. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. 
Um, everybody, that was Attorney Lee Merritt, and uh, he gave you his website and all of his contact information, so please make sure that um, you reach out to him, show him some love and support. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. September 6, 2018 changed my life, changed my family's life, changed my country, changed my church. And I know that there are many people who stood with me and my family throughout this tumultuous journey. Yesterday, we saw the conviction of Amber Geiger, and today, we heard the sentence of 10 years in prison. That 10 years in prison is 10 years for her reflection and for her to change her life. But there is much more to be done by the city of Dallas. The corruption that we saw during this process must stop. And it must stop for you. Amen. Because after now, I leave Dallas, but you live in Dallas, mm -hmm. yes. and it must stop for everyone. Yes. The contamination of a crime scene mm -hmm. that we saw coming out of this case yes. is one that must never happen again. again. Yes. Right. The poor training That's or the right. poor use of what should have been training. That's right. Yeah is what we see coming out of this case. Yes. That should never, ever happen again. That's right. Amen. Amen. And if this was applied in the way that it ought to have been taught, mm -hmm. my son would have been alive today. Yes. Yes. Amen. If Amber Geiger was trained not to shoot in the heart, mm. right, right. my son would be standing here today. He was no threat. He was no threat Shame. to her. He had no reason to pose a threat to her because he was in his own apartment, in his sanctuary, in the place in which he paid a lot of money to be in. He paid rent to be there. He had every right to be there in whatever state he was in. Yet still, out his, his, his privacy was violated. Amen. She intruded on him. Yes, she did. And that was not enough. She killed him. That's right. Cold blooded. Yes, she did. Cold blooded. Murder. Our life must move on. But our life must move on with change. That's right. Yes. That's right. We gotta fight first. There's gotta be a better day. Mm -hmm. And that better day starts with each and every one of us. Right. right. The city of Dallas needs to clean up inside. Amen. Right. The Dallas Police Department has a lot of laundry to do. Amen. The Texas Rangers yes. need to know who's on board. Yes. And every single one of you, citizens of Dallas and residents of Dallas, need to know what to do to get your city right. That's right. We're always interested in what you have to say about our live broadcasts. Please share your comments on our Facebook page or websites.